Hello, I'm Ros Atkins. Welcome to this week's edition of The Media Show. And we're going to talk about two enormous scoops and one resignation. It was Pippa Crea from the Daily Mirror who first reported on that Christmas party in Downing Street last week. And then we had Paul Brand from ITV News putting out a video he'd obtained from a practice press briefing inside number 10 last December in which we saw Downing Street staff laughing, joking about a party at number 10 during lockdown. The issue has been everywhere in the media. It dominated Prime Minister's questions as well. And we're going to get into exactly how those scoops happened with the help of Pippa and with Paul. But first of all, the Prime Minister's advisor, Allegra Stretton, has resigned. She was one of the people in that video. And this is what she'd said about that resignation. My remarks seemed to make light of the rules. Rules that people were doing everything to obey. That was never my intention. I will regret those remarks for the rest of my days. And I offer my profound apologies to all of you at home for them. There's Allegra Stratton explaining her resignation. And we also want to look at this story and what it tells us about the broader relationship between the government and the press lobby. To help us do that, we have Katie Perrier, the Director of Communications for Theresa May when she was Prime Minister, Michael Crick, political commentator for Mail Plus, and Kitty Donaldson, the UK political editor for Bloomberg News. But let's start with Pippa Crea from The Mirror. It was your story, Pippa, which started all of this. When did you first hear that there had been a Christmas party in Downing Street? Well, I actually first heard rumours way back in January, but they were just that and I wasn't able to substantiate. I tried my best, but didn't manage to get there. And then about a month ago, I got handed what I'd describe as a metaphorical brown paper envelope, which contained enough evidence in it for me to start asking questions again. So I then spent several weeks speaking to sources about whether a party had taken place. And then once I'd established that it had, speaking to them about who was at it, what was done at the party, you know, the secret Santa and the and the, the festive games and drinks and nibbles and so on. Um, and then we were just really waiting for a moment that it'd be that would be the right time to publish. So you come back to this story, you start having lots of conversations building on what you'd first heard about in January. Can you pinpoint a moment when you thought, my goodness, this is a huge story? Well, last Tuesday, I was sitting in the number nine briefing room, the same room, in fact, that, that Paul's video, uh, the video that Paul and ITV showed of Allegra Stratton was filmed in and listening to the prime minister's official spokesman at the normal lobby briefing. And that morning on the radio, Dr. Jenny Harris, the government, uh, the, the UK health security agency, agency chief, had suggested that people might want to be a bit careful about how they socialised at Christmas and cut back on that in the in the coming weeks because of obviously the emergence of the Omicron variant. And with that at the back of our minds, we were all asking questions of the PM spokesman about whether we should be having Christmas parties, whether it was wise to follow her advice and what the official guidance was. And he made it quite clear that the official guidance at that time was not to cut back on Christmas parties, that these things could go ahead. Um, and uh, was you know was, was really quite clear about that. Some interpreted that as a bit of a slapdown, in fact, of, of Jenny Harry's. And I remember sitting there thinking, my goodness, people are talking about Christmas parties again. We have the uncertainties of what happens in the next few weeks and months with Omicron coming up. This is going to be in people's minds again. Now's the moment to do this story. So you decided to run the story on Tuesday of last week, but were you ready to go with it actually quite a lot earlier? I suppose I could have pulled it together quickly. I mean, it, none of it was actually written as I sat there in uh, the number 10 briefing. Uh, that's, I had all the information I needed, but I needed still to sit in front of my keyboard and bash it out. And mm. of course, I did, then did that very quickly earlier in the day. And then, of course, lawyers wanted to have a look and the news desk wanted to have a look and the people that put the paper together, the online team, everyone mm -hmm. was discussing headlines. It's a bit of an operation. And you say that your editors quite understandably trust you because of your track record. But when you go to them and say, OK, I've got this sourced, how many sources do they want from you? Is there a particular number that you have to clear? I think, again, it depends on the story. I mean, I have a personal rule that if you are 
writing a big story like this that you can't just do it on the basis of one source unless you have un uncontrovertible evidence um, or they are somebody that you trust absolutely implicitly. But I've never done a big story like this based on just one source. I've always preferred multiple sources and not, not least because mm -hmm. in establishing the facts, I think it's quite important to be able to sort of, you know, you might get one bit of information from somebody else which corroborates something from somebody else um, and you build up a fuller picture. So, you know, the more the better always. How many were there on this particular story? I had several sources on this one. So that's your experience. We'll come back to it. Paul, let's bring you in. When did you hear about this video? So we heard about this video some time ago, uh, and it's actually really interesting listening to, to Pippa explain her story there, because I had a similar experience, actually, that we, we were aware of this video some time ago. But actually, sometimes it takes the work of one journalist to help another journalist. Um, and we had some really important considerations when we were looking at this video. I mean, it was filmed ultimately in a private setting. So there's a high bar for publishing that video. It needs a public interest. Uh, and on the first look at the video, um, before the context of the past few weeks, that bar we didn't feel was met. But when Pippa published her story and the denials began coming out of Downing Street, uh, the public interest transformed because we were able to demonstrate that perhaps what Downing Street were telling us wasn't quite in line with the way they were talking behind the scenes around the time that the party is alleged to have taken place. Now, hold on. I just want to make sure I've understood this, Paul. You'd heard about the video. Does that mean someone had actually told you I've got a video or maybe even had shown you the video but said you we're not going to give you a copy of it yet? Or you just heard rumours around Westminster that a video might exist and someone might have it? We've been working on this story for several weeks, um, so we were aware of the video um, and we were working through the legals and we have a fantastic lawyer here, John Battle, who was working with us in, in great detail on all of that. But like I say, things changed when Pippa's story was published. Well, before we talk further, let's hear some of this video. Would the Prime Minister condone uh, having a Christmas? <laughs> What's the answer? I don't know. I didn't want the party. It was cheese and wine. Okay. It's not obvious. <laughs> Is cheese and wine all right? No. It was a business no. meeting. <laughs> I'm joking. This is recorded. This fictional party was a business meeting. <laughs> and it was not socially distanced. <laughs> So this is a video from last December, just before Christmas. And this isn't an actual briefing, we should explain, Paul. This was a practice. Yeah, so Allegra Stratton had been planning to host these televised briefings, the first time that televised briefings had happened in the UK, a bit like the White House briefings that already happened in America. And the idea was that she would come and present what is actually a regular lobby briefing that already takes place, but it would be on camera for the first time. And so what she was doing was she was asking colleagues to help her to rehearse. So there were other press officers uh, and special advisors in the room who were throwing her questions, the kind of questions that journalists would ask her potentially if she was doing it for real on that day and she was rehearsing her answers sometimes formally sometimes less formally which is actually what you see in the clip that you just played there now we were looking at the video and of course the impact that it's had and we noticed some questions coming up again and again about it so if you don't mind i'd just like to ask you them um did itv pay for the video no we did not pay for the video and why did you choose to blur some faces in it but not everyone's so again, Ros, that comes back to public interest and uh, obviously the repercussions for those who are identified uh, can be quite severe, as we've seen with Allegra Stratton's resignation today. And we felt that we only wanted to identify those people who had said something that was in the public interest. And there were people in the room who uh, were participants, but perhaps not particularly active participants in the rehearsal that day, or they had made interventions that we didn't feel um, met that test of being in the public interest. And you tweeted it out early evening. I saw it. Of course, thousands and thousands of us saw it. And one thing that was curious was initially there was a short clip and then I went back on Twitter and everyone was going, hold on, there's more. Now, tell us about the decision making about releasing the shorter version before the longer. So there's an interesting dilemma for broadcasters and newspapers these days, which is how much do you reveal your hand on social media alone? Because ultimately, as a news organisation, you'd like people to consume your content through your own platform. And at ITV News, we have a website, we have an app. Uh, and ideally, what we would like people to do is go and, feed, go and read the full story, the full piece of journalism that's taken a lot of time and a lot of effort. So what we decided to do was to, to release a short clip, which gave people a flavour of the story so they could understand what they would be clicking through 
you to read more about. And then the full video with the full context of the article was there on the website to be read uh, in, in full. And the final question we've seen being asked a lot is whether this was filmed off a screen or whether it's actually the original video. That's something that I, I can't get into with you, Ros, because um, as Pippa was saying earlier, protection of our sources is, is just of the utmost in, importance to us. Uh, and that means uh, not just protecting the source's identity, but protecting how material comes into our hands. Well, as of course you know, Paul, and everyone listening, I'm sure, knows, at Prime Minister's question earlier, Prime Minister's questions earlier, this was the dominant issue, and Boris Johnson turned to the video that Paul had obtained. I apologise unreservedly for the offence that it has caused up and down the country, and I apologise for the impression that it gives. But I repeat, Mr Speaker, that I have been repeatedly assured since these allegations emerged that there was no party and that, and that no Covid rules were broken. And that is what I have been repeatedly assured. And Pippa, as you listen to that and listen to the Prime Minister say that essentially your description of the event that you reported on is wrong, how does that feel? Well, it's no different from what they've been saying every day this week, frankly. And, you know, I guess what it comes down to is a couple of things. One is what your interpretation of a party is. And in my mind, 40 to 50 people crowded cheek by jowl into a medium sized room, drinking, eating nibbles, playing party games, doing Secret Santa until past midnight, even if it is in a work environment, is a party. Um, and secondly, the legalities of it, and there are only three areas um, in which the government could point to it to sort of justify its claim that it's that this gathering was within or any gathering at this time was within the rules. One is whether it was um, a permitted event, but there would have been no mingling allowed um, between households, and clearly there wasn't this instance. The second is that if there was a what was regarded as a reasonable excuse for gathering in the work environment, I don't think anything anybody would regard a, a Christmas party as a as a reasonable work event. And thirdly, is this sort of dispute claim as to whether this sort of event was allowed, permitted, um, because COVID regulations don't apply on in government departments. Now, that is a very tricky one for the government, because if it is true, and I don't know whether it is, you'd have to ask some, some legal minds on that, then it, gen it, it would literally be one set of rules uh, for mm -hmm. government and one set of rules for everyone else, which I think would be an incredibly bad look for them. Pippa, Paul, thank you very much. You're going to stay with us. Before I bring in our other three guests, I'll also mention, and this is a story that Pippa's very closely connected to, lots of people have been following the Downing Street Christmas Party story and making some comparisons with the Barnard Castle story involving Dominic Cummings. If you want to hear the inside account of that story, well, Pippa's editor, Alison Phillips of The Mirror, along with Kath Viner, editor of The Guardian, spoke to the media show on an earlier edition of the programme a few months back, which you can still listen to online. Now, let's bring in Kitty Donaldson from Bloomberg News, Michael Crick from Mail Plus and Katie Perry from In-House Communications and former Director of Communications when Theresa May was Prime Minister. Katie, I wonder how you assess how the government's handled the last nine, ten days. Uh, it's been utter disaster, one following another. Um, I feel that Boris Johnson actually made things worse at Prime Minister's questions today, not better. Uh, and I never like to see an advisor go uh, and crying on the doorsteps because actually, um, it, it, you know, the person that went home early uh, ended up taking the rap for it. And I don't think that's fair either. Uh, he says that he was sorry for the offence, he's sorry for the video and sorry for the impression it gives. But there's no sorry for the party. Um, and there's no comments on other parties that have been uh, the allegations that have been put to him today as well. So I think but the public aren't really falling for it, nor the journalists either. And I think this is going to run and run. But he has a track record of, of not saying sorry for things. And he is the prime minister and was mayor of London, something that you were involved in. So you'll know that's been a successful political tactic for him. And the thing is for Boris Johnson is that people give Boris leeway in a way that they never give any other politician the kind of leeway. They, they, they price it in with Boris Johnson that he doesn't act like something he's not, that he's not saying he's whiter than white. It is what it is. And, and they seem to buy that and they seem to like it. I mean, recent elections in, um, in Old Betsy and Sidcup, you'll see that the Conservatives won again only a week or so ago. So it seems to work for him. The problem is, is that this is a moral issue and it's also an issue where people have been stuck at home and, and, and lost loved ones during uh, lockdown. And, you know, they don't take kindly to that. So this might be the moment where his luck runs out. 
Now, someone who's been offering a, a commentary on the last few days has been Dominic Cummings, former advisor to the Prime Minister, and he tweeted, some lobby hacks were also at parties in the number 10 flat, so they're trying to bury this story. Michael Crick, you've covered Westminster for many years. Do you think that, you won't know the specifics of that particular allegation, but are there situations in which lobby journalists either don't maximise a story or turn away from it completely? I think inevitably, I think it's that's less the case than it used to be. I mean, 30 years ago, 30, 40 years ago, lobby journalists would turn a blind eye to all sorts of things going on in government in order to preserve their, their sources. I think that is a lot less the case these days. And I think the lobby is, lobby journalists, political journalists, those based at Westminster, are a lot tougher on politicians, and, and rightly so. Um, I think it's difficult in this case, because if some of the people... Some of the lobby journalists were at the party. They're potentially sources. People are saying, well, shouldn't we as journalists expose which other journalists were at the party? Mm -hmm. It's very, very tricky for people doing this story um, to uh, get, get the story from perhaps other journalists and, and, then, uh, and then expose them. They can't do that, can they? Well, Pippa, you have been reporting on this. Were there any journalists at the party? At the Christmas party in number 10 on December the 18th, it is my understanding that there were no other journalists there or there were no journalists there. I think mm -hmm. the allegation which Dominic Cummings was making was about a separate date in the Downing Street flat mm -hmm. and possibly people who, report, journalists that may have been friends with the Prime Minister or his wife. But certainly the reports that I've uh, written, no other journalists, or no journalists, I should say, keep using the word other, no journalists were present. Kitty Donaldson, let's let's bring you in. What's your approach? What's Bloomberg's approach to when to socialise and interact with politicians and when not to? That's a, <clears throat> that's a difficult question. Um, well, obviously, as a reporter, I go off and see sources all the time and I have coffees and I have uh, lunches with senior politicians. Um, and sometimes I go to parties that I'm invited to. The Prime Minister usually has a number has a number 10 Christmas party for journalists. Um, we're not sure if that's going to go ahead this year. Um, but I, I wonder if think... you'll be invited, Pippa. <laughs> I hope so, if it goes ahead. Sorry, Kitty, I interrupted. No, that's OK. Um, but the thing I always try and keep in mind is that the people I'm reporting on are my friends. And so there's a there's a professional detachment there when I'm when I'm talking mm. to them. Do you feel that detachment, Paul, as you watch the consequences of your story have a personal impact on Allegra Stratton and potentially on others too? Yeah, I mean, the the story involving Allegra Stratton was an interesting one for us at ITV. Of course, she was a well-liked and actually a very kind former colleague to many of us here at ITV News. Um, so that was an interesting dimension when we were tackling the story, but we decided that we had to treat it as if she was any other subject of a report where we had to just maintain... Um, that professional separation actually from the story um, and imagine she was any other figure in, in number 10 who perhaps we, would, we didn't know anywhere near as well but um, you know we're human beings and you have sympathies and you have feelings for people and we don't like anyone to see we don't like to see anyone's suffering because of a, a story that we've broken but ultimately you know it's the public interest that we serve as journalists. Katie, you've managed these relationships from the other side when you were, particularly when you were working with Theresa May. How did you view them as as friendships, as working relationships, as nothing more than something that served both sides? I think it was a working relationship, and I'd known many of these journalists before I had entered Number Ten, so that helped also. But it's a game of cat and mouse. I think that the journalists feel that you're constantly trying to cover up. The truth and we feel on um, the other side that journalists are picking over every single word and trying to make something out of it trying to say that there is skullduggery or wrongdoing when actually that you're one slip of a word and all of a sudden you're in you know a whole new territory i think that there are cozy relationships between special advisors uh, and uh, journalists and that's how some of the feeding of the stories goes but it does come back to how your principal wants to act Theresa May didn't want that cozy relationship she didn't want that feeding structure and so it changed quite differently from my relationship with journalists than the ones that David Cameron's team had before I remember going to the US and Trump uh, we chose uh, Laura Kuzma from the BBC uh, and a journalist from the Sun to ask questions of Trump from um, the UK side and afterwards he said to me you call them your friends? And I said, no, they're not our friends. Mm. We live in a democracy and they hold us to account. He didn't like that very much. No, I imagine he didn't. And 
it's interesting you talk about the agendas, both of politicians and their advisors, but also of journalists. And Michael, when you're considering source information coming in your direction, presumably you're acutely aware that whoever's giving it to you may well have an agenda. Indeed, every time some source tells you something, you have to say, well, why are they telling me this? Why did they and why did they come to me? What is it they're trying to get across? Can I believe them? Um, and depending on whether they've got an interest in this coming out or whether it's uh, just something they happen to know, that is all come, becomes part of the assessment and part of the calculation that you have to make as to how many and what strength uh, of other sources uh, you need. But this whole thing about friendships is a difficult one. I mean, Allegra Stratton used to be my producer on Newsnight. I mean, I, I, I was on friendly terms with her. I can't say she's a close friend these days. Robbie Gibb was the same. He was a colleague of mine. He used to work for Theresa May and Downing Street. Previous to that, he worked with me in the BBC. So these relationships are very, very difficult. My own style is to sort of try and keep a certain distance as much as I can. Um, but there have been relationships in the past. I remember in the Blair years, uh, both Alistair Campbell and Peter Mandelson were very close to certain journalists. And, all, and it always seemed to be those journalists mm. that came out with the stories that were favourable to the, the Blair government. And I, you know, I, I was very uncomfortable about that. And I think a lot of our colleagues are uncomfortable about that, that certain journalists can be used as mouthpieces for certain politicians. Kitty, I wonder if you agree with that assessment. Absolutely. Um, I started work in the lobby during the Blair years. Um, I was very young. I didn't know many people. And it seemed to me that the certain senior types, particularly I think at the times, at the time, were getting all the all the scoops, and you know my employers were saying, well, "Where where where are you on all this? Why aren't you getting the scoops?" And as I've got older and I've developed my own contacts, I think the same thing happens. And and you you have to take a view every time you're told something, which as Michael says, was, you know, why why is this person telling me this, and what's their position in the party, but pre- and what? Yeah, sorry, Rose. No, but presumably if they give you information a couple of times and you don't run a story, in the end they're going to start thinking, well, this journalist isn't much use to me because I'm giving them valuable information, but they're not putting it in the public domain. Yeah, and there's always that risk. But um, I was trying to take a view that you're playing the long game and, and, and if someone's insisting on telling you things, you've got to kind of wonder why, you know, why are they saying this to you? I mean, much, much trickier is, is the occasion when you've got a source who gives you regular good information and then you get some information that's adverse to that source and you have to make the calc... Well, you, uh, uh, you, you're in danger of losing that source um, if you run it. Mm-hmm. I mean, ultimately, I think you have to run it because ultimately you have to judge the story on the public interest and not whether you're going to mess up a, a potential future source. But it, it, it does... Those kind of dilemmas... You get all the time in this uh, business of political journalism, which makes it, uh, you know, ever so, uh, all the more fascinating in, 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 as a, 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 in terms of what one should morally do. Well, it certainly is fascinating listening to all five of you. As we enter the home straight of this edition of the media show, Pippa and Paul, I must ask you, when you're in the middle of the maelstrom, when the information is out there and it's having an impact, are you talking to the sources who gave you this information? Pippa, are you in touch with them saying, look... You see, I told you if you'd given me this information, it would have this impact. Um, I'm in touch with sources, but uh, normally, and then certainly in this case, it's more of a case of, um, you know, are you okay? Are you, you know, how, how are you finding all of this? Sort of almost like a sort of a so support, a, I so guess. So it's a duty of care. Oh, definitely. Absolutely. And that continues. I mean, mm. I'm you know, still in touch with some sources from the, the Barnard Castle um, scoop. That goes on for a very long time. Paul, have you spoken to the person who gave you the video? We have done, and, and I would absolutely repeat what Pippa's just said about duty of care. And I think that's something you have to bear in mind all the way through, is that we, all of us on this show today, are used to operating in a media environment. Often the sources that we're speaking to have no experience whatsoever of the media until the point at which they're thrust into that spotlight. And that, um, to some degree, was the case with our source uh, for our story yesterday. So we absolutely have a duty of care to them to make sure they're OK, that they're dealing with that pressure OK, um, because they're anxious, um, like any source would be, about being found out. And um, we have to make sure that we kind of hold their hand through that, really. I've only 30 seconds, Michael, but in those seconds, we have a resignation today, a high profile resignation. Does the story still have more in it, do you think? Oh, a lot more in it. And I think Allegra Stratton's 
duty now is to go around to the local police station and tell them what she knew. Uh, we've got a cabinet secretary inquiry, we've got police inquiry, or at least potentially a police inquiry, if they take it seriously. This is going to run and run. And there is the huge anger on the Conservative backbenches amongst Conservative ministers. And so many other Conservatives have been dragged mm -hmm. into this by having to defend the Prime Minister and, and things they clearly don't believe. Michael, that is the last point of today's programme. Thank you very much to all five of you. I suspect we could have talked about this for a lot longer, but Pippa Crea, Paul Brand, Katie Perry, Michael Crick and Kitty Donaldson have been my guests on today's media show. Don't forget, you can listen back to all of our editions via the BBC Sounds app. And the media show will be back with you at the usual time next week. Bye-bye.